Last year, we reported on the most dramatic and hotly contested election ever in Samoa. Prime Minister Fiame Naome Mata'afa made waves and a list of the top 100 most inspiring and influential women in the world. She was here in Aotearoa last week, being mobbed by our Samoan Fano and making quite the fashion statement too. It was her red coat which sparked controversy online. My young relatives who keep up with social media were updating me on, on, on the conversations around that. I understand, you know, dress codes and so forth. And I do have dress codes. But you know what? My red coat is the warmest thing. It's light and it's red. Uh, I like it. <laughs> Itanya tu te piri mea o haa moa a fia me Naomi Mata'afa ki te whare pāremata. A hakoa ngā take nui o te huringa o te tai ao me te whakahau maru. Kwa puta hoki te wero kia nui a ki tā te kāwanatanga tauawhi i te reo o haa moa ki Aotearoa. When you're in Auckland and you're around Māngere and places like that, do people get excited when they see you? Oh, no. We came through here last week. We came on Sunday, um, overnighted and they had a flag raising ceremony here for Mangere. I essentially got mobbed, so it was a bit scary. Well, I had to <laughs> laugh because we had New Zealand security. I mean, I've got my yeah. one guy with me. <laughs> you know, once those Samoan women came in, they, they couldn't move, you know, and all I could see were people's heads. I mean, you understand the engagement from the diaspora during the last elections. Mm. So I've definitely felt the Samoan community just wanting to come in and, and, and make that physical contact um, because we had journeyed uh, with them. Fiamir Naomi Mata'afa, the first female Prime Minister of Samoa. Decades of parliamentary experience and she drew on all of it in the aftermath of the 2021 elections. So last year, 2021, was the election of all elections. All of our eyes were on it. Every Samoan in New Zealand was watching. It was very tense. There were words thrown around like treason. Um, how hard has it been for Samoa to accept there's a new era now, a new party in charge? I think it's coming around. I mean, we've just recently had the Australian um, election. You know, the results came out before the night ended. The former government has, had conceded, congratulated the new government. So, you know, we see how functioning, uh, well-oiled uh, democracies work. Um, we sort of got there. It was a bit glitchy. <laughs> Jeez, there's an understatement. The Human Rights Protection Party, HRPP, had been in power since 1982. Tuilaipa Sailele Malilingui did everything in his power to reverse the election results, even locking out Samoa's Chief Justice from the House of Parliament. Once you opened up all the books and that, did you find anything that you thought, oh, no wonder? Well, I mean, there were, of course, you know, immediately you find decisions that were made. One of the other things, too, is that under emergency rules, uh, you know, you can almost do anything. Yeah. So we were very quick to bring the budget process back uh, to normal process. You didn't find anything go, oh, far out. They <laughs> did that, <laughs> did you? Well, yeah, there are a few, but, um, but this is the thing. You can do the blame game, but I think uh, for me it's more about um, how do you fix that and how do you move on? Fiume entered Parliament in 1985 and was Deputy Prime Minister to Tui Leipa between 2016 and 2020. What's your relationship like? Oh, it's always very cordial. Um, I mean, we're not bosom buddies by any means. For me personally, it's about issues. I think. Um, if politicians were to take things personally, it would be a very uh, dire sort of environment to, yes. to exist in. 
the election was marked by an astonishing tug of war between the executive and judiciary. And in May this year, Tui Lepo was permanently suspended for breach of parliamentary privileges and contempt of parliament. I'm just wondering how people's confidence in the judiciary is now. I think it's building back. Um, and, and I think most significantly, because the other two arms of government were so dysfunctional, you know, the executive with the um, HRPP holding on for dear life, it was all dependent uh, on, on the judiciary yeah. uh, being able to carry out its mandate. And, you know, I think um, that they did a job. I mean, they were tested, we were all tested. Fast Party won the election with the slimmest of majorities. The name is, could you just... Fatuatua Ileatua Samoa Otasi. Which means? Samoa United in Faith. Mm. I saw a phrase that said, faith in one true God. Is that, is that an accurate translation? No, what I said. The role of religion mm. in Samoa is very, very strong, yes. right? Um, does it present challenges? No. Nope. Well, do you have policies in, in, in the party to advance the inclusivity of the rainbow community? Not per se. We used to have quite archaic legislation, you know, uh, around uh, homosexuality mm. and so forth. Um, so there have been amendments, you know, throughout time. Interestingly enough, uh, you are raising it. You know, we've had the fafafinge uh, elements in our society for ever, mm. uh, and yet seemingly in these modern times, um, you know, the discourse is you know around legislation again, you know, and recognition as a society you know, where the law says this and seemingly the, 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 the social culture, values yeah. and cultures says this. And then you see the practice happening. Um, you know, I think we have to reconcile all, all those mm. and, you know, to be very honest about those things. Do you think there might be a time when same-sex marriage might be allowed in Samoa? Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to happen soon. They elect parliamentarians very differently than how we do here in Aotearoa. As members of parliament, yeah. a requirement is you have to be a matai. So uh, that construct then has that built in to, to our constitutional uh, setup. Does that work for everyone? Like, is at a village level, at a matai level, do women come through or does that p pipeline have to be strengthened? Well, I'm a woman. You are, indeed. <laughs> um, and there, I mean, it's predominantly male, but, you know, there is a building number of women uh, matais. Uh, we still have some villages in Samoa who don't allow women to hold title, or if they do, uh, they function uh, in the sphere of their families, yeah. but do not actually sit uh, in village council. So we see it as, a, as an evolving uh, situation. I'm actually waiting for some brave woman to challenge it constitutionally. The daughter of Samoa's first prime minister, Fiume, is set to make history as the country's first female leader. Now, there are many people that are in your party that are first-timers in, in Parliament. Our party is predominantly all newbies, and I like it. They're fresh, you know, they're, um, they're themselves. I hope they stay that way. Yeah. You know, all these people come in uh, as Matais. You know, they're seasoned uh, people in terms of responsibilities for their families, extended families, their communities. So, you know, national politics is just uh, another level. But it's fundamentally, you have to remember that it's about people's representation. Yeah. So that's the other thing about politics. You know, you can't pick your team. Mm. You, I mean, you know, it's who the, the constituencies bring out. We don't have a party selection process like you have here. So it's essentially villages sort of meeting in 
Yeah. Well, and, and some of the men, they must have pretty high chiefly titles. Mm. Are you able to rally them all together? Well, because I outrank them anyway, so from a male perspective, I suppose that helps. It's handy, eh? <laughs> Proudly independent, Samoa paddles its own waka while still being part of the wider Pacific family that includes Aotearoa. I'm just wondering how Samoans see that relationship. Is New Zealand considered to be cousins or big brother? Mm. Um, well, it's layered. Kia ora, I'm back with Prime Minister Fiamme Naomi Mata'afa in the heart of Māngere. For many years there has been some talk here about decolonising the New Zealand justice system. Is there anything we can learn from Samoa? In terms of your justice system, for example, does that have a, a Samoan kind of a, a, a flavour to it or foundation to it? Are the outcomes represented differently? Your particular issue here is the referencing um, of how that law is applied. Mm. Now, your, our situation in Samoa is quite different because it just applies to Samoans. Yeah. But, you know, it becomes more marked, you know, in your society, you know, where it's uh, multicultural. If you see um, that this common law seems to impact, you know, your... Um, particular um, population, then of course it does raise questions. I had a press conference with your Prime Minister this week and the issue of the ceremonial apology for the Dawn Raids yes, came up. Yes. I also hope that our presence and apology here today helps weave together our connections as people. So that's very much a, a, a Samoan way. Uh, it's a mitigating element in terms of when the court makes its decisions. Yeah. There's recognition of ceremonial apologies, the reconciliation, so yes. In 1962, a treaty of friendship was signed between New Zealand and Samoa. Article two declared that where appropriate, the governments shall consult each other on matters of mutual interest and concern. What are our mutual interests, do you think? People. <laughs> the mobility of, uh, of people. Mm. And, you know, the Treaty of Friendship, it recognises that we have a history. We have a past uh, colonial history under the New Zealand administration. We acknowledge with regret the decision taken by the New Zealand authorities in 1918 to allow the ship Talune carrying passengers with influenza to dock in this harbour at our pier. There were also the shootings in this town, our pier, in December 1929, of non-violent protesters by New Zealand police. On behalf of the New Zealand government, I wish to offer today a formal apology to the people of Samoa for the injustices. Prime Ministers Helen Clark and Jacinda Ardern have both apologised on behalf of New Zealand to Samoa for historical injustices. One of the things that I wondered was whether having Minister Nanaya Mahuta uh, in the international circles, does that strengthen that kind of bond? Is oh, that... definitely. Mm. It definitely does. Yeah. Mind you, you also had Winston. You did, yes. <laughs> yes, you would have met him a, a few times over the years. Yes. I always wonder at um, the Pacific Island Forum when Australia and New Zealand are there, mm. if like the representatives from Vanuatu and Samoa and Tonga are having their cup of tea and looking over there and thinking, there's a little bit of a them in us. There, there, there's always an element of, of that. Yeah. If we say, this is our region and it has Australia and New Zealand in it, then you know we, we definitely have to uh, do that. And then there's China. According to the Lowry Institute, Samoa is one of the most heavily indebted countries in the world to China, owing the equivalent of almost 20% of its GDP to the country. Last year, when um, during the election, and there was 
um, conversations from FAST members about the port being built. Was that because of the amount of debt that Samoa owes to China? Is that a concern? It is a concern. Um, when we came into government, we actually uh, reached the limit of, you know, debt, debt ratio uh, to our GDP. But in, in terms of the port, um, it was quite a significant project. Um, and we made the choice to say no. Samoa and China have history. Plantation workers first arrived in the early 1900s and there's been much intermarriage. This year, both governments signed an economic and technical cooperation agreement. Some of the Samoans that I spoke to, they said that one of the issues that they have is, is the way the narrative in the media about China, they say that it kind of infers that the that island nations are sort of slightly ignorant or don't understand geopolitics. Quite frankly, it's, um, it's patronising. Um, it, it doesn't infer. It, it <laughs> you know, it, it shows that uh, there's thinking there that uh, Pacific Islands are incapable of uh, navigating uh, the relationships. Mm -hmm. We all have relationships with China, New Zealand, Australia, I mean, even the United States. I mean, it's a huge market. So everyone wants a bit of China. Um, but, you know, it's the game of influence, mm. of ideologies and so forth. So it, it, it's funny, you know, um, people operate, you know, in, on, in, in one sphere, you know, they're saying one thing and then, and then they are doing something completely different, you know, yeah. especially when it's, when it's business. Yes. And, you know, for us in the Pacific, um, you know, as small island states, our, our foreign policy is essentially trying to na navigate. We're having to steer in terms of where, you know, the, the major players uh, are at. Yeah. It's not easy. Fiamir Naomi Mata'afa was named one of the 100 most inspiring and influential women of 2021 by the BBC. She comes from a powerful family. Both parents were members of parliament and matai. Her father was the first prime minister of independent Samoa and one of four paramount chiefs. Fiamir assumed her father's matai title when she was just 20 years old. You've inherited quite a big legacy. Mm. Is that heavy? Not at all. It, it is what it is. Mm. And I've been very fortunate there are responsibilities, of course, that go with it. 